The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And listen, this is the first time I think I can truly say, honestly say, and I don't think I've used this line before. I really don't. I don't think this guest needs an introduction. Usually, this is the part of the show where I spend 10, 15, 20 minutes putting the guest over, then bringing the guest on. I don't have to do this with this person because I know he'll do it himself. So that goes without saying. We'll probably get the next, who knows, however long we can get of him putting himself over. But I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, and he doesn't even know this. This is a guy that if I had my druthers, he would have been the first guy I ever had on the show. And I'm going to be honest with you, I was afraid to ask him to come on the show. And the reason why was I was afraid he was going to turn me down. As ridiculous as that sounds, I was afraid of being rejected. So it's taken me a year to bring him on the show. But all that matters is he's here tonight. And I'm talking about one of the greatest guys in the world. Bubba, are you there? I am here. And I will put myself over. <laughs> hey, Bubba, you want, you want to know something funny, bro? I, I, I got to be honest with you. There are times, like not so much you, but there are times with you where this happens with me. Bubba, I swear, for some reason or another, I don't know why, there, there was only like one person in the business that like I was always like a little intimidated by. I was afraid to talk to him. I could never get over it. And we were friends and we talked a lot. But I was like, I was always afraid to talk to him for some reason. Who do you think that might be? Because I, I had that a little with you, a little, but I felt much closer to you because of the Italian bloodlines. So it was never really an issue. But, bro, you know who I was always, like, intimidated Wait. to talk to? Let me see if I can guess. Um, Steiner? No, night, bro. I used to love talking to Steiner. But you're close, bro. It's like it's along the Steiner lines. Okay. And and, and I think when I tell you you're you're, you're – Definitely understand. Possibly. Go ahead. Nash, bro. I, I, I was, I've was. i always been in – why is that, bro? Uh, that I have no idea. Probably because um, guys like me and Kevin are pretty straight shooters. We look you in the eye and we give you our honest opinion. And sometimes people don't like that. I'm not saying that you don't like that, but – that's um I know for me, you know, that word intimidating has followed me around in my personal life or, or in, you know, the world of pro wrestling. I think, you know, guys like us are a little different. We we always say what would we, we feel. We're extremely passionate. We look you in the eye, and we're not good at stroking egos and coddling people. So maybe that's why we're intimidating and people get nervous to talk to us but well, let me ask you this and bro, bro i always say this man like yeah to me like all the good people bubble like all right you know in in wrestling like for some reason or another like all the good people are on the outside looking in like all the good people that could change this business like this tomorrow are on the outside looking in and you said something, bro, that was so to the T. And I think, I mean, bro, you talk about on the outside looking in. I mean, I, I think me, you, and Taz are the poster boys for this. But, but why do you think, especially in wrestling, bro, why don't people want to hear the truth? Why can't people hear the truth? Why can you never be man to man from my heart? This is honestly how I feel without there being repercussions. Just like Jack Nicholson said, uh, you know, you can't handle the truth. And most people in this business can't handle the truth because if you're telling them the truth, you're probably telling them what they're doing wrong whether that's a wrestler, whether that's person, somebody in creative, whether that's an owner of a company, most people don't like to hear the truth. Um, when you're passionate about anything in life, baseball, pro wrestling, rock and roll, 
you're always going to be honest with your assessment of the product that's out there. And, you know, the way I was brought up, you know, in this business was always to be honest with everything that you do. And sometimes that honesty has bitten me in the ass because people just don't want to hear the truth or don't want to hear Bubba, you know, spouting off about how we can make something better. But at the end of the day, I thought that this was, I thought that's what it's all about, putting out the best product we possibly can. But, you know, Bubba, here's the deal, bro. When people critique you, when people critique me, when people critique a guy like Taz, especially a guy like Taz, Bubba, here's the bottom line. Coming from the East Coast, being New York is immediately like on knee-jerk reaction would probably be to spout off and to jump down somebody's throat. That's probably what we'll do. But then, bro, like plan B kind of takes into effect a little while later when we're by ourselves and we'll start thinking like, okay, why did that person say that? Is there anything to that? Can we take what they said to make ourselves better? Th that's what we we do. But what I find, bro, is outside of you know New York and the Northeast, they don't take it to that second level. You're honest with them. You piss them off. And if they don't agree with you, they don't see what they could take out of that to make themselves or the situation better. Would you agree with that? Well, there's a lot of selfish people in this business. There's a lot of people who hold silly grudges for no reason. Um, and they probably take that first reaction of, you know, you know, blowing up at them and they just, you know, they take it to heart. Um, one of the things that I've worked on, you know, in my personal life and in wrestling is I no longer blow up at things. I, I've become a much better listener. I hear what people have to say and then I try to give a rational, constructive answer without letting my passionate New Yorker, Italian, talk with my hands, you know, <laughs> be what people, you know, uh, judge me by. You know, my entire career, I have been uh, judged by the manner in which I speak and not for the words that come out of my mouth. I can't help it that this, I, you know, I talk harsh. You know, I could sit here and tell you, Vince Russo, I love you. You're the greatest guy I've ever seen in my life. You have a wonderful family. You have beautiful daughters. Your wife is awesome. It doesn't exactly sound pleasant to the ears, does it? Because of that heavy New Yorker I have in me. And I think that's what people have. So you start throwing this into everything and you start talking really passionately. And, oh, my God, this is what we should do. And here's how we make the product better. And people are going, whoa, this guy's crazy. But they're not listening to the actual words. You know, but I've said this on more occasions, and I think people think that I'm kidding around when I say this, and I'm actually not. You know, Bubba, you hear about racism, you hear about minorities, you know, you hear about all this. Bro, I swear to you, and, and I believe this wholeheartedly, I believe as New Yorkers that we are stereotyped especially in the wrestling business, and that we are the minority. And Bubba, I'm telling you, I think the fact just that we came from New York and everything you said, bro, we're loud, we talk with our hands, we speak our mind because we're passionate. I think that stereotypes us. I think that hurts us from square one. And I think people outside of New York can never get over that. And I dealt with that so much in the wrestling business, especially working in Nashville and especially working, you know, in TNA. What, what am I crazy, bro? Or did you, do you think it's a territorial thing? Well, especially in wrestling, I think that New York, you know, people that came up in the wrestling industry in the Northeast will never truly understand the way, uh, you know, promoters and wrestling in the South do things and vice versa. We just handle things two different ways. I think both sides have the best interest in mind, but they go about it in different ways. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the, 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 the joke that you and Jeff actually used to have about what was better, the honeymooners or, or uh, 
Maybe a- Andy Griffin, bro. Come Andy on. Griffin. Come on, bro. Please. So, you know, both both think that they have the better shows. Um, and it's just, you know, it's just a it's a perception thing. You know, when when it when it comes to when you're a New Yorker and you have to deal with somebody from the south in pro, you know, in the pro wrestling business, um, you think that they move a little too slow for you or that they're not thinking about things the right way. And then when they hear us, they think we're crazy, we're overreactive, you know, we don't know what the hell we're talking about. It's all about being able to understand each other better. But, yes, I do agree. From the Northeast, we have the stereotype. But they have the stereotype, too. Bro, do we really – listen, Bubba, do we really think they're moving too slow or are they really moving too slow? Come on, bro. They're moving at the pace that they're comfortable with, and we move at the pace that we're comfortable with. Wow. That's not, that's not a safe answer. That's an honest answer. Nah, I don't know. Bro, listen, I want to ask you this. You know, I, I was having an argument with my wife this morning. I want to find out if I'm right about this. Bro, bro, I can't, the, the thing I, I can't wait to talk to you more, uh, more than anything about is, bro, I want to talk about your upbringing and I want to talk about your background, you know, the Italian roots. That's very important to me. But, Bubba, my wife's from the Midwest. I've been married for 31 years. She's from Evansville, Indiana. Her name is Amy. Now, Bubba, I go out of my mind because when we grew up in the Northeast, okay, you had your summer fruits. And you had your winter fruits, bro. And you you looked forward to the summer fruits in the summer and the winter fruits in the winter. And the winter fruits never made the summer crossover. Bro, my wife has oranges and apples in the fruit bowl now. And I'm trying to explain to her, those are winter fruits. You don't eat apples and oranges in the summer. You eat peaches plums, nectarines, cherries. Bro, is that just me or am I right about that? Honestly, that sounds like grounds for divorce. Bro, don't tell me you don't tell me you eat oranges and apples in the summer. Bro, I live in Florida now. You eat oh. oranges 24 hours. Oh, a day. please with the Florida, bro. Please with the Florida. You can eat oranges anytime down here. Yeah, but not in New York. But wait, in the winter, you eat peaches and you soak them in the wine. Oh, bro, now you're talking, bro. See? Oh, so you my. Can't eat peaches in the winter. Oh, bro, my grandfather, man, every single night. Bubba, this is what I want to ask you and about. Wait, and wait, wait. Don't you dare touch one of those peaches unless it had the proper amount of time to soak <laughs> in that red wine. Bro, no doubt about it. I mean, absolutely. I mean, it was there, there, there was a whole art to it. Bubba, talk to me, man, about, about the Italian roots and growing up that I miss, miss so much. Because, bro, I want to segue that with you into today's society and what I think some of the problems are and some of the issues that I deal with. Give me, please, give me a little bit of that uh, Italian heritage background. Well, I mean, growing up as a kid, I came up from a very, very, you know, Italian family. You know, every Sunday, everybody on my father's side of the family would go to my grandmother's house and we would have Sunday dinner there, and all my cousins got together, all my aunts and uncles. It's kind of like out of the movie Goodfellas when they said, you know, we were never with other people. We were always just around the family, right. and that's what it was. Our family was our best friends. Our family are the people that we had the most fun with. Our family is the people that we would go away on vacation with. You know, it was all about your family. And, you know, back then when you had cousins, you know, you used the term cousins with such reverence. You know, these are my cousins. You know, it was almost as like they were your brothers or your sisters. And, um, you know, my father was from Sicily. So I grew up, you know, with a very, you know, he was strict, but he was very cool and lenient because my dad always wanted, my dad wanted to be a boxer and my dad wanted to be in films. I'll tell you a funny story about my dad about a movie too. But um, 
and I grew up with a very Italian mom. She came from, her family came from Bari. And um, her side of the family, like my grandfather would always say, we're not going anywhere. My house is the church. <laughs> so really, really Italian family, you know, um, always together. Everything always centered around food, you know, constantly eating. Um, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I had an awesome childhood. I didn't come from a broken home. I didn't live on the streets. I didn't, you know, smoke cigarettes, do drugs, get drunk, you know. They brought me up the right way. I had, I didn't fear my parents, but I had a lot of respect for them. And when you are brought up that way, I believe you're putting a, a quality human being into the system. But, but what do you think about these people uh, that put sauce on their spaghetti compared to gravy? No, it's called gravy. Exactly. Bro, listen. Bubba, I want to hear about this. Listen, explain. Listen, so, Bubba, did you grow up with, with were both sets of grandparents still alive? Um, on my mother's side, yes. On my father's side, uh, my grandfather passed away when I was like three. Okay. And, and, and did they always, bro, did they always break into Italian when they didn't want you to understand what they were saying? That happened with my mother and father. I, they, my mother and father spoke Italian in the house all day, all night long. And me and my sister were just kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> had no idea what was going on. They constantly spoke Italian. And one of the things that I don't resent my parents for anything except one thing. They never taught us how to speak Italian. So here I am, this hardcore guinea from New York. And I didn't even learn how to speak Italian. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I just wish they would have taught us and spoke to us more. They only spoke to one another. Bubba, tell me, he, he, here's what I here's what I want to segue into, and here's what I want to talk to you about, because I've been doing so much thinking about this lately. You, you touched upon it. Talk to me about discipline in an Italian household. Bro, you came just like me. It was me and my sister. That was it. The, the four of us in the Italian household. Give me a little background into how you were disciplined as a child. How did, how, how did, how, your father didn't have to earn his respect, but what was it about him that made you respect it? Well, when it came to discipline, you remember the line from Goodfellas, the way I see it, everybody takes a beating every once in a while. Right, right. Well, in my, in my uh, household, it was you catch a beating first, we ask questions later, okay? So I would catch a nice little beating, and then after everything calmed down, I'd get, okay, let's sit down and talk about this. Now you want to talk about this? You could have saved me an ass kicking, you know, 15 minutes ago. Yeah. But, um, you know, my, my parents were, were disciplinarians. And, um, you know, if you didn't do well, if you lied, if you, uh, you know, if you were out of line, if you were disrespectful to one of your aunts or uncles, you know, you, you caught a smack, and I grew up with seven uncles, which meant that all seven aunts and all seven uncles had the green light to smack me in the mouth at any given time without my mother or father even batting an eyelash. Yeah. So I was disciplined uh, pretty hard, but uh, you know, most of the time was because of school. Like, I wasn't the greatest student in the world, and uh, I kind of just, you know, flaked around in school. So it was always like, why are you doing bad in school? Why are you doing bad in school? Catch a quick ass kick and, and move on. Now, now, Bubba, did did your parents um, see? Because I'm going to tell you this: my grandparents had this defined role, but that that defined role changed to my changed with my parents. So I kind of got to see the best of both worlds. So I, I got I got to see what I thought worked. And what what I thought was flawed. Now you you know, Bubba, I'm a big uh, yeah, I'm a big I'm a Christian guy. I'm a big believer in God, big believer in the Bible. In the Bible, you know, especially the first chapter Genesis, you know, God clearly defines the the roles of, of a man and a woman. Clearly, he, he makes it crystal clear. In your household, growing up, was dad dad going out? the money winner, making the money, doing what he ever had to do, and mom, the role of the mom, raising the kids, you know, being there for the kids and the family, cooking the meals on the table. Was it that? Was it the traditional family? No. 
Ex- explain that to me. My mother and father worked side by side every single day. Um, my mother's father, my grandfather, was in oil. So they owned an oil company. So when my mom met my dad, my dad was a, a bricklayer. And so my dad was such a hard worker that my grandfather offered him into the oil company. So my mother and father would wake up five o'clock every morning, drive to their company in Brooklyn, work all day together, drive back an hour home, and then we'd have dinner, they'd go to sleep, and they, it would be repeat. So I didn't come from that traditional Italian family of dad is the breadwinner, mom takes care of the household. From like the third grade, I was waking up to an empty house coming home from school to an empty house. And I saw my parents for about two hours when they got home. So it forced me to mature real quick and, you know, kind of fend for myself. And then on the weekends, obviously, it was all about family time. Bubba, you want to know something interesting? Like, I've never spoken about this before, but I'll tell you what, real interesting. My grandparents on my mother's side, okay, they were your traditional, you know, bro, he worked in the garment district in New York. He came home every night, bro. I'll never forget it. When I, as a little kid, fedora, long overcoat, Bubba, daily news under his arm. And if that black coffee was not on the table, the minute he walked in the door, there was hell to pay. And my grandmother was Edith Bunker. I, I mean, these were the rules. Uh, these were the roles, I mean. And that's what I grew up on. So, like, you got, you can imagine, I looked at my grandfather, like, in awe. Like, oh, my, like, such a powerful man. Y- you know what I mean? Now, that's the way it was with my grandparents. The black fedora, the black, you know, overcoat, you know. Um, and my grandmother totally took care of the house. Um, So, yes, on that one, totally agree. And my grandfather was really strict also. Um, He was uh, was a great, great man, but you could not step out of line. He would definitely put you back in your place. Um, You know, my grandfather is also, you know, the guy. I learned so much from my mother's father, my grandfather. Um, I'll give you a, a little example and how it has helped me till today, especially within the wrestling business. When I was a kid, I would always want to go down to the candy store and buy wrestling magazines. So what I I would always say, Grandpa, can I have $10? And he would say, no, I'm going to give you $20. That doesn't mean you have to spend it all. He was teaching me the value of a dollar. Mm -hmm. Just because you got a $20 bill in your pocket doesn't mean you have to spend $20. Spend your $10 on wrestling magazines and then take the other 10 and put it away because you never know when you're going to need $10. Yeah. And, you know, in the wrestling business, you know, that helped a lot because, you know, I put everything away because you never know, you know, an injury, God forbid, you never know when it's going to end. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I, I learned a lot of lessons from him. So, so Bubba, so, so now keep in mind, my mother – came from that very strong father. Meanwhile, Bubba, you're going to appreciate this. My father was the second youngest of six kids. He had a very strict father. Bro, my father used to have to make the wine in the basement 10 hours a day for his father. So, bro, my father was very subservient. Mm -hmm. So what happened, Bubba, was that my mother came from this strong father. My father was subservient to his father. So my mother ruled the roost when I grew up, bro. So, like, I got to see two totally different. My grandfather, it was Archie and Edith. And then I got to see the complete other side where, like, my mother wore the pants in the family. And, 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 Bubba, I'll be honest with you, that really bothered me growing up. Because, you know, I, I looked up to my grandfather as a Roma, as a man's man. And when my father, like sometimes he used to be such a wimp with my mother, it used to drive me nuts. And I always used to say, I'm not going to be that way. I'm not going to. He was the most gentlest, 
meekest man in the world and still is. But he was subservient to my mom. Okay, so who rules the roost? You or Amy? Me, uh, we, we got my, uh, we got, we got the old school relationship, bro. We, okay. we got the old school. But, but this is what I want to talk to you about. I, I want to get down to the root of this. First of all, well, I got to ask you this question before I do. How, bro? Did you ever want to have kids? Nope. Never, huh? Nope. Tell me why. From a, I, I don't like kids. I. From a very, very, very young age, I always knew I wanted to be a pro wrestler. And I knew that if I ever made it in pro wrestling, having a child would affect my career. I'm smart enough to know that I don't want the responsibility of children. I don't really like the world that we live in. And I think that if I was to have a child, by the time he reached a certain age, he would be you know, kicking, screaming, and fighting just to get by in the world we live in. Um, I know the kind of disciplinarian that my parents were. I don't want to be that same type of disciplinarian. And in the, the world we live in today, God forbid you spank your child and they find out about it. So, but the real reason is the responsibility. I knew that I never wanted the responsibility of a child. And I like I like knowing in the back of my head that if our interview uh, ended right now, I could close my computer, go to the airport, and fly to Hawaii if I want. And nobody can tell me I can't, and I have no responsibilities holding me back. Bubba, I would have to think, though, that – and I, 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 I'm going to go down the road that I was going to go down, and you, you hit upon it really, but I would have to think that's probably ended some relationships for you, no? Nope. Any girl that I have ever been with for um, an extended period of time, it's out in the open immediately. And if I am with, if I was with somebody and they wanted kids, it ended quickly because I wouldn't do that to a I wouldn't do that to a woman. I wouldn't be with her knowing that she wanted children, knowing that I definitely didn't. But but I want to uh, I I want to I, I want to ask you this. Bubba, listen, I I have to now. I don't have a choice, bro. Uh, you know, I have to be on social media a lot. You know, th this podcast, this this channel, uh, this is what I do. So I'm um, constantly, Bubba, you know, on Facebook, on um, you know, on Twitter, you know, all over the place. And the hatred, the hatred that comes from total strangers who don't know you and can just sit there and spew hatred at you. It's, 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 I, I sit here and I really, Bubba, I, I, this is what I want to talk to you about. I try to understand where can that hatred come from? If, if you have the choice to either put somebody over or bury them with negativity and hatred, why in the world would you choose negativity and hatred? It just doesn't make any difference to me. But here's what I want to talk to you about, Bubba, because I got a theory to this, and you hit on this. Bubba, I'll never forget, when my boys were growing up, uh, my son Will uh, was 13 years old. His brother is three years younger than him, so they were 13 and 10, okay? Okay. I used to own a business in Atlanta, Bubba, and they worked for me at that business, okay? And I remember one day at work, my 13-year-old was disrespecting me in front of customers, making me look like an idiot at 13, Bubba. And I'm, I'm, I'm working saying, okay, okay, okay. And they, w they went home before I did, okay? So, bro, I'll never forget one time this happened. I get home. My two boys are in front of the TV. They're playing the video games, right? Bro, I, 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 I hate to say this, but I don't, I, you know, and, bro, like I said, this is 15 years ago. He's 28 now, bro, right? My son was laying on his stomach playing video games where I came in the house. Bro, I hauled off and kicked him. And my 10-year-old was there. 
And I said, you never, ever disrespect me like that again. Okay. He was 13. The younger one was 10. Bubba, to this day, that one time, they've never, ever disrespected me again. Shit. Okay. Got the job done, right? Bubba, I have a daughter. She's 20 now. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Bubba, like when you have sons and you have daughters, it's two completely different animals. Okay. And I could tell Bubba by the time 12, 13, 14, they're turning into little divas, like right before your eyes, bro. Okay. So I remember Bubba, and you said this, bro. She was probably about 13, 14, and she said something to me. And, bro, like you, you'll appreciate this. Bro, did you ever get your mouth washed out as a kid with soap? Yes. <laughs> you get the, the, the show, soap shoved down your throat. Yep. Bro, I never forget. At 13, Bubba, I turned to her and I said, I'm going to get a bar of soap and shove it down your throat. You know what she turned around and said to me? Go yep. ahead and do that, and I'll call child services. Bubba, my daughter turned 20, and you want to know something? Last week... She was having a conversation with my wife r- right behind me and, and referring to me as an a-hole with me standing right there because I went to see Jurassic Park without her, okay? And, bro, my daughter never got hit once, okay? So now, like you said, bro, I look at today's generation, And I look at all the hatred and all the attacking and all the negativity. And what I believe that comes from, Bubba, is the lack of the old school discipline because there's no repercussions. You can say anything you want to anybody and no one's going to say a damn thing about it. And disciplining your children. And, and you know, Bubba, I don't know how it started. What do you think? What was the start of parents not being allowed to discipline their children anymore to the point of where the world is today with the social media and the bullying and the hatred and and, and kids and teenagers and young adults being able to say whatever they want to say without any repercussions? I don't know when it started. I don't know what the catalyst was for it, but I know that it never went on in my household. Um, it's like, um, what's that term they use these days? Uh, you put your child in timeout. Right, right. You hear that? You know, if your child is being bad, you put them in timeout. Well, when I was growing up, I was put in timeout also, but timeout was the amount of time I was actually out from my dad cracking me a shot across the mouth. And that taught me, the, 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 the physical discipline always taught me to have a little bit more respect. Um, the physical discipline always kept me in line. I don't know why you're not allowed to put your, you know, uh, you know, put your hand on your child. If your child deserves a smack in the butt, or, you know, a smack in the mouth. It's been working for a hundred years. Nobody is going to, you know, no, no real harm comes from it, in my opinion. I mean, obviously, you're not supposed to beat your kids. I'm not talking about beating your kids. But every once in a while, a kid needs a spanking. It's been working since day one, right? Mm-hmm. Did you get spanked? Well, well, you know, bro, I, I, I got to tell you, I really didn't. But like I said, I was in such a fear of my grandfather. I would never do anything out of line just because of that fear. So so it it, it never really called for it, bro. I really never did anything bad enough to be spanked. And as far as the uh, the other issue you brought up about the negativity and the hatred and don't feed into it. I mean, you're talking about, you know, you know, nameless people, faceless people who sit on their keyboard and take shots at you for no reason because they know there's not going to be any repercussions. 
and they're just trying to make themselves look good. You know, Vince Russo is a very easy target. Let's gang up on Vince Russo. Let's tell Vince Russo he sucks. Let's tell him he's the worst Christian that ever walked the planet. Let's tell him uh, we hope he dies in the pits of hell. Big deal. When you come across those people in real life, look them dead in the eye and say to them, say it now. Oh, yeah. No, but, <laughs> but, Bubba, that goes for people in the wrestling business. They go out there and cut the, cut the promos and do the interviews and the this and that with the Vince Russo stories. And I'm like, listen, I've got my own forum and show here. You, anybody, you're invited. You you have an open invitation. You want to come on this show and talk to me about the issues and the problems you have with me face to face. I'm I'm here. I'm I'm what, bro. Nobody, nothing. But yet I'll read this about me. I'll read that about me, and I'll read the other thing about me. Because a lot of people in reality are cowards. They don't want to face you. They don't want. Everybody wants to be the perceived good guy. They want everybody to like them. But that's not realistic. It's not realistic in life. It's not realistic in the wrestling business. One of the things that, you know, I'm brutally honest with people in the business. If I like you, you know about it. If I don't like you, you know about it. Um, a couple of months ago, I came across somebody that had spoken poorly about me over the years, but had never said anything to my face. So when I saw this guy... I said, come on, we're going to lock ourselves in a room and we're going to see who walks out. And he goes, why? I go, it's because of all the things you've said about me. So now's your opportunity to say it to my face. Let's see who walks out of the room. What do you think that guy did? What did he do? I, 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 don't, I don't know because I don't know what I would do. He backed down and he started apologizing his balls off and yeah. backpedaling yeah. and all that stuff. Because in the end of the day, people are cowards. Yeah. And when they got to come face to face with you, they, they don't have the balls to do it. Yeah. Bubba, I want to, I, listen, I, I don't want to talk about wrestling. I don't, I, I don't, but I want to talk a little bit about a philosophy because you're a great person I talk to. Bubba, listen, nobody dealt with, and I call them generation me. Nobody dealt with them more than me. The, these younger athletes who came up knowing more than Vince Russo will ever know. And Bubba, I'll tell you, I would sit there and I would say to myself, brother, go out and do it your way because you will never get over. I, I didn't sit there and argue with them. You, you know how to do it. Go ahead. And I can sit here and confidently say, Bubba, none of them got over. And then, Bubba, I talked to uh, – I had a, a, a great conversation about two months ago with Bill DeMott, you know, talking about the Johnny Rod school and the type of trainer Bill DeMott is. Then, you know, I know you and I know the reputation of, of you and Devon and the school. And I talked to Samuel Shaw, who was a student, and he told me what that school meant to him. And, bro, you, you can – bro, what, you, when you have a, a respectful wrestler – you know it immediately. And you know it, bro, because of the way he was trained. But, but here's my problem. Here's my question. I know when students come to your school and they pay you and Devon, you are going to teach them the right way. And you know what, bro? If they don't like the right way, then they're going to leave. They're not going to make it. They're going to be gone. OK, but once they go through your school, like a Samuel Shaw, uh, you know, and uh, what's his, who was who was a uh, Rob, Rob Terry, who was a great kid. Once they go through your school, bro, now they know how to be wrestlers. OK, bro, how do all these generation mirrors, Bubba, how do they go through the system? Without anybody giving them the discipline, you know, shutting them down, making them learn respect, making them understand what the business and life 
is all about. How do all of them nowadays, Bubba, escape that? And all of a sudden, here we are. We're we're on Monday Night Raw. We're we're on TNA, and and we're entitled twenty somethings. How do they scoot through the system and make it to that level without anybody shutting them down? Probably for the same reason why a a kid grows up to be a disrespectful person to his parents because from day one they weren't taught the right way. Me and Devon pride ourselves in the way we train our students and the level of respect that we instill in them from day one. We break them of any type of ego that they have from day one. I say things to these students that I probably shouldn't say because after I'm done with them, I expect them to run out the door and not pay their tuition. Mm -hmm. I give it to them up front. There's only one guarantee that we make at the Team 3D Academy, that if you make it through here and you spend a year and you learn this the right way, the one thing you will have is respect for the wrestling business. You will have respect for your fellow wrestlers. You will have respect for the industry. And you people will know that you came from this school. And one of the, you know, the stories have gotten back to me and Devon that we're very proud about, like a guy like a William Regal. We've had a lot of students go through uh, developmental tryouts or be in NXT, and William Regal will walk up to people and go, you were trained by Bubba and Devon, weren't you? And we hear this from a lot of people. Now we have veterans who can actually pick out our students just from the level of respect that they have. Um, so if you take them as puppies and you train them the right way, and every time they step out of line a little bit, you put them right back in line. That's how you put quality wrestlers back into the system. Most of these guys, your, your generation, me, who have the sense of entitlement, have gone through a school where they were allowed to do anything that they wanted in that school. They probably got by on a little bit of athletic ability and they had nobody instilling in them the proper respect of the business. So that's why they have the attitudes that they do today. There are so many guys out there training young wrestlers that have no business training anybody. I can teach an 80 year old woman or a monkey how to do wrestling moves. Anybody can train anybody how to do a move. That's easy. But teaching the respect of the business, teaching the old school way that has worked from day one, there are not many people qualified to do that. Bubba, I got to ask you this. And, and again, I don't want to talk about wrestling, but I have to ask you this, Bubba. Listen, I... You know, in the position I'm in right now, uh, you know, you know, the the Oprah of, po of podcasting, uh, I'm forced to go back, Bubba, and really do research on the wrestling business. And Bubba, you would be amazed how when you go back and read about the early roots of of, of wrestling, Bubba, the word that is there over and over and over again is entertainment mm -hmm. wrestling was a sideshow at carnivals to entertain people you go and then, then bro go back to gorgeous george go back to antonino rocca it was built on entertainment okay bro it's go do your research people that's what wrestling was and you and me our whole lives generation after generation we're entertained we're entertained bruno san martino chief j strongbow the big cat ernie lad hulk hogan ultimate warrior jake the snake robert stone cold steve austin the dudleys we're entertained now bubba the internet wrestling community the smallest uh, the smallest percentage of the audience with the louder voice have always been rating. I hate, I'm going to say it, bro. I'm sorry. I'm going to hear about it. Have always been rating fake wrestling matches on a star system. 
Okay, the, they want the wrestling. They want the wrestling. They want the wrestling. And bro, I was at the WWE. And for years and years and years, yeah, we hear you. You want the wrestling, but you know, this is your life. Rock is the highest rated segment in the history of Raw. So we never listened to them because Bubba the psycho the mentality was the internet wrestling community, they're gonna as long as the name wrestling is in the show, they're gonna watch it. And then they're gonna bellyache about it the next day and watch it the next week and bellyache again. You gotta capture all those other fans. But Bubba, somewhere along the line, I think in Philadelphia at the Royal Rumble, I think there was a clear, decisive time that we could put a finger on where all of a sudden, bro, the WWE, well, I have no idea why, start listening to this internet wrestling community. And, you know, this internet wrestling community, NXT is the greatest thing they ever saw because it's all wrestling. It's very little character development, very little entertainment. It's all wrestling. But now, Bubba, the scary thing is that NXT all wrestling is now making its way to the main stage and is now on WWE, and guys are coming through the curtain that look like me. There's no fanfare. There's no presentation. There's no entertainment. There's no story. They're great wrestlers. And you look at the numbers, and the numbers continue to go down, but the business continues to go in that direction. Bro, what the frig is happening? Well, when it comes to wrestling companies um, listening to the voices on social media or the internet, the dirt sheets, I believe that's because it's the only feedback that there really is in wrestling. It's not like you can turn to People Magazine or some type of review journal or something where we hear any feedback. The only feedback we really get from our fans is via social media and the dirt sheets. And the internet wrestling company, um, their voice has grown in the past 10 years. And I like to think that we should give wrestling fans a, a two-hour show should be very diverse. Mm -hmm. Here's your great entertainment. Here's your great wrestling matches. Here's your blood and guts. Here's your hot girls. Okay? Mm -hmm. I don't remember the last time a pure wrestling match sold a ticket. Mm -hmm. I think I know when it was. When do you think the last time a pure wrestling match based on pure wrestling ability sold a ticket? Oh, God, bro. I <laughs> When the only buildup to the match was about the wrestling, when was it? I don't know, bro. I, 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 I think no. back... I, I think back, the thing that comes to, 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 to mind to me was I remember many, many years ago. I don't even remember the year I was there. I remember Brett and Sean had an hour Iron Man match. You yeah, know, but Sean is an entertainer. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah. Yes, both great in ring performers, in ring wrestlers, great entertainers. But when was the last time a match was sold just on the wrestling that was going to take place? I don't know. Tell me. Benoit and Angle. Mm -hmm. And that's 10 years ago. So, yes, so th there are a lot of great wrestlers out there who only go out there and wrestle, uh, exchange holds, do takedowns, do moves. But to me, that's not entertaining. I think it's ent entertaining to a very small uh, part of the wrestling community but I like characters that we can emotionally invest in who then can back it up with their wrestling ability. And when it comes to stars, any wrestler who um, uh, wants 
how many stars his match received, well, that's the definition of a mark. Okay? They're being marked for themselves. I don't care how many stars you give my match. I don't need an extra star on my match. I need an extra zero on my paycheck. Yeah. yeah. Okay? Zero is the biggest number. Just put an extra zero on my paycheck, and I'll be happy with my two-star match. Yeah. So, you know, that, that's just my opinion on it. But I, I've totally learned to go with the flow in it, with it. You know, I can appreciate a good wrestling match. Like, I'm going to take guys like AJ and Joe. Mm -hmm. AJ and Joe go in that ring. I can appreciate a good athletic contest between those two guys. Okay? But I don't want to see two hours of it. Mm -hmm. I want to see a show that, it, like, wrestling is a giant buffet. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about buffets, we're talking about Tommy Dreamer, and Tommy Dreamer has a weight problem. There you go. There's my Tommy Dreamer fat joke for the day. Okay? Yes. So wrestling should be about a be a buffet. You get a little bit of everything on your show. That's how you draw the masses. A little Correct. bit of everything for it. But the kids like this. The father likes this. The mother likes this. That's how you do it. But it's very, very simple. Very simple. Bubba, you and I never spoke about this. I want to talk about this now. I want to bring some things to light. I spoke about this with, with, with Devon, my beautiful black brother. He says it's okay if I call him my beautiful black brother. I got that cleared. And, you know, bro, I think, I think Devon did some covering here, you know, to be honest with you. I don't think he was shooting straight with me, okay? okay. And, Bubba, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? I, I, I say very little about Paul Heyman, okay? And I'll tell you why. My one of my experiences with him, it makes it it makes it hard for me to put him over because of an experience I was involved in. And, and I'll tell you what that was. OK, I'm working at the WWE now. It's just me and Vince. OK, Vince tells me we have a relationship with ECW now, uh, you know, ECW and Paul Heyman. And I'm like, OK, Vince, what does that mean? Vince says Vince, I don't watch ECW. You watch their show. If you think there's somebody on that show that we should grab, he says, you let me know. And, you know, Paul will tell the talent, and then the talent will come work for the WWE. Okay? So, bro, I did exactly that. I went and I started watching ECW. I probably watched it bub up. See, pe people like always accuse me of you ripped off the attitudes, uh, you know, uh, from ECW, bub up. No, I didn't. I probably saw about four to six ECW shows, but I'm watching the ECW shows and there were characters that jumped out on at me. Okay. You, I I'm not blowing smoke, bro. I, the stuttering, you know, I was always a mark for that. You jumped out at me first. You the, the Dudley thing I loved, okay? So, bro, I would go to Vince and say, okay, Vince, there, there's, there, there's these guys on wrestling. They're called the Dudleys, blah, 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 blah. I think they would do great here, okay? Vince would say, okay, Vince, let me talk to Paul, okay? Get together with Vince the next session meeting, and I'd say, okay, Vince, what, you know, did you talk to Paul? And he goes, yeah, Vince. He goes, Paul told me, you know, that he spoke to the talent and the talent wasn't interested in coming to work for the WWE. Now, Bubba, listen, not for anything, not to put ECW down, but, you know, I, I, watching ECW and, and knowing it was really regional and you had the WWE here, which, which I know is every wrestler's dream. The first time Vince tells me that, okay. OK, but, bro, the second and third time with with three different talents, when Paulie tells Vince, oh, the talent doesn't really want to come to WWE. At that point, I'm like, come on, bro. Listen, it's everybody's dream to work into WWE. If it happens once, OK, if it happens twice, maybe it's happening the third time now. No, no, nobody at ECW wants to come work for the WWE. I, I just really, really had a hard time with that. But in your case, luckily, uh, a third party contacted me. 
and told me you guys were interested in speaking to me. And per so that's why, like, right then and there, I knew the gig was up. Because you you were one of the people that Paulie said, no, they don't want to come work at the WWE. My 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 question to you is, um, you know, number one, I you know, I, I obviously I want to hear your reaction to that, but number two, were you even aware that there was any interest in you before you were able to get in contact with me? No, I, this is actually the first time I'm hearing the story, but. And I'm not shocked by it at all. I mean, Paul is a businessman. He owns a company. And one of Paul's greatest creations within ECW was the Dudleys. And Bubba and Demon went on to become the biggest heels, you know, in the history of ECW and, you know, really helping the company to move forward. So I'm sure Paul was just trying to protect one of his top acts. But part of the story about that, you're talking about the third party, a guy by the name of Black Jack Brown, who was a photographer and a journalist who used to report on pro wrestling for the Daily News in New York. I was good friends with him. You were friends with him. Black Jack knew that you were interested in us. Black Jack knew that I, me and Devon were interested in, you know, possibly, you know, branching out. So I was on the phone with him one night, and he tells me, hold on. And this is when there was three-way calling. <laughs> so he says, hold on. And he clicks off, and he clicked back on, and he goes, Bubba, I'd like you to meet Vince Russo. Vince Russo, I'd like you to meet Bubba. And that's how we started talking. Um, and, and really, that was it. And then I remember going to Paul um, after... Uh, I believe it was Heat Wave 98. It was the, a pay-per-view in Dayton, Ohio. The, that night we went to him and we said, listen, you know, we spoke with WWE and they're very interested in us. And I remember that Paul did have a shock look on his face, almost like the look of how did they get to them, you know, after I've been trying to, you know, stop it for so long. And, and that's just the way it is. And, and you know, we spoke with Paul and we told Paul, listen, we'd like to stay here. Can you, can, you, can you make us an offer to stay here? And he says, I can't get in a bidding war with them. I said, we're not asking you to get into a bidding war with them. Just bump us up a little bit because we truly were passionate about ECW. It's we helped ECW grow. I was doing so much for the company outside of the ring. And I always appreciated the opportunity that Paul gave me to do that. So we really wanted to stay. But he said, I can't can't do it and that's when i realized how ecw was truly like a breeding ground for the ww and that they were allowed to pluck talent whenever they wanted to so i mean i i, I totally understand how he was trying to protect his own investments by doing that that doesn't bother me at all the preceding presentation was brought to you by the realm network